Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 4, our fourth episode, the topic, this episode is generative AI and the impact. Obviously SuperCloud is next gen cloud, multiple environments, large scale, the role of data has been the topic. Ben Koos is the CTO of Box, is here with us. He could not make it in studio for our, our live in-stage performances here, remote. Ben, thanks for coming on remotely, appreciate your time. Happy to be here, thanks for having me. So the role of generative AI is all the rage, obviously machine learning, ML ops have been around for a while. We've seen a lot of supervised, unsupervised machine learning over the, over the decade, role of data, Box is not a stranger to that in the enterprise. Enterprise data can be kind of hairy, you got enterprise surge, how do you get all, how do you all wrangle it again? A lot of, a lot of tech there. Now with generative AI, a gift has fallen in the industry. You're in the middle of it, you're doing a lot of work there at, at Box. Uh, how are you looking at this how is it impacting your company and your customers? Oh, um, you said it was a gift and, and completely agree. Um, so the, the power of the new uh, generative AI models is just wonderful, even compared to the previous models, which were also very um, awesome. It's really the last 10 years of like all the advancements in, in, um, in machine learning and neural networks. And then a lot of things became possible that weren't really possible before. Um, but um, like with Box one of and with many of our enterprise customers, um, one of the big uh, concerns, of course, is this unstructured data, right? It was just always so hard to do ML on unstructured data. And since like 90% of, of the data in any organization is unstructured, uh, audio files, video, um, doc files, PowerPoints, PDFs, just all this really valuable data these companies have, it was just always so hard for them to be able to process it. Like the way you process, like if you have your data structured, you can do a lot of wonderful things with it. But if it's unstructured, you kind of have to read it. And then when the new AI, uh, uh, generative AI came out with these new wonderful uh, large language models. Um, suddenly, you could actually have the AI not only sort of understand things, but also start to help you create some content. So this has just been really eye-opening for everybody, and in particular, I think um, many large enterprises are looking at it and they're saying, "Wow, like the what's possible now is different than what was possible a year ago." And in, in their minds of sort of production class uh, AI, and they're in, in in many ways, I think a lot of companies are still thinking about like, "What can we do with this?" Um, there's a lot of, of interesting use cases many people are adopting, but still, like almost every day we talk to customers, they're they're still thinking, "What else? Like, what more?" Can I do and 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 they're seeing that the rapid evolution of this AI is 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 continuing. You know, one of the things I really admired over Box over the years since the early days of the founding, especially uh, with Aaron and the team, was they made things simpler in an era where enterprise playbook was to solve complexity by making it more complex. Um, yeah. Which is the classic enterprise playbook, right? For if you're a vendor, get them yeah. in. You guys also took some territory down in a competitive enterprise market where there's a lot of muck and toil and undifferentiated heavy lifting. Database is now the advent of structured, unstructured data coming in. Now with IoT and everything's connected, there's a tsunami of devices, analytics is top of mind, but the budgets aren't increasing as fast as the data increases. So the problem is, okay, how do I create value, right? And this is a technical problem, not just the apps. So I got to write apps for the business, but I got to run IT and platform engineering at the same time. How are you looking at this as the CTO? Cause you got to wear both sides of that hat. You got to look internally and make some innovation happen to enable that app value on the front end for the customer. Yeah. So, um, I mean, our customers will, will tell us straight up. They'll say, um, I, I need to be able to prove that this is um, helps me in my business uh, concerns. Um, of course, the technology is totally awesome. And of course, there are many different aspects of that everyone wants to talk about. But at the end of the day, when it comes for them to, to pay more money, they're going to want to make sure that it is giving them value. So things like making sure it's uh, it, it drives productivity, making sure that it is um, helping uh, uh create things that maybe were not possible before. Those kinds of things are sort of the number one, uh, the sort of the, the business value uh, at conversation that our customers are having. So for us, we look at that like um, being able to take the AI and apply it to you know their data, the the, the content. This is the this this sort of begins the conversation of okay, now how how if we start to do that and we start to do more of it, then how can I make people more efficient inside of my, my organization? Or how can I achieve things faster? How can I get to market faster? How can I do all these tasks that everybody does kind of every day, but then just do it either faster or better? And I think that's where most of our uh, customers' minds are at right now. I want to get your thoughts on uh, in reaction to a statement I'll make, and I want you to, to look at it from the perspective of, of a, of a pro-AI perspective. You got a couple things emerging. You got the AI wrapper apps that just wrap around some of the large language models, feed it some data very well engineered on the prompting side, whatever. I were, yeah. I'm oversimplifying it, but it's simply like, I would call it like building a website on top of the web. Okay, yeah. you can do it. It's a great app, people use it, great. I'm a fan of that, by the way. I was kind of poo-pooing it before, but I think AI wrappers are not a bad thing at all. 
Secondly is na native, native AI apps. And then third, AI systems. Okay, so three kind of categories of things emerging. What's your reaction to that? Do you agree? Would you uh, elaborate? Do you see the same thing? What's emerging? I mean, what's, what's the, the spectrum of yeah. systems? You have the system, so, the native, and then the wrapper. Yeah, um, so I, I think, um, uh, so for the idea of the wrapper, which is to say like, you know, the AI has certain capabilities. Why don't you just expose it directly with sort of, um, uh, minimal, maybe other uh, value propositions around that. Like um, in, in many ways, again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. There are many companies who um, exist because their job is to make things better. Like in, in it, and it matters a little bit less if it's like the revolutionary, like crazy technology versus like just they just Easy focus to on <laughs> yeah on solving problems really well. Um, so, uh, from our from our view, um, like one of the things that is critical and critically important is that um, you have to have not just solve the AI problem, right? Maybe maybe a long time ago, like AI was a competitive advantage, but but even the fact that we're talking about like a wrapper, AI is is everybody has access to the same fundamental technology, like which is um, you know either online via yeah. uh, OpenAI or via Google or via any of the wonderful vendors that are out there, um, and um, and so it's not that hard for anybody, big companies, medium-sized companies, small companies, to just start to use it. So um, the what is the what is the advantage that you have um, on top of that? And and um, so of course the way we look at this is to say um, uh, the value of of content overall um, is to make sure that uh, uh, that you can apply AI to it safely, securely. One of the big concerns with some of these things is that you have to be a little careful with like security and permissions. Like if you're not careful, the AI itself becomes a, a like a source of data leakage, which especially when you talk about bigger enterprises, this becomes a big challenge. And so um, I, I think uh, this is where you start to see that uh, you want um, for, for companies to start with a, with a really cool value proposition as a wrapper, they have to either um, build out the rest of their their value uh, their product offering, um, or um, of course uh, other other companies are always looking to add AI to what they do. So on the system side, do you see any impact like a new neural network, LLM, data APIs? I mean, is there a paradigm shift on the on the far end of the spectrum that's emerging that you see? Because you know we're seeing the conversation range from okay, low hanging fruit to a lot of experimentation, some production, mostly through some tooling and some picks and shovels, helping people get get some stuff into production. But there's, there hasn't been a lot of conversations around that's large scale, that's in production, that's a full big workload. We're not there yet. Is it going to be there soon? Do you see the progress happening faster or are there good stuff in production for workloads or is it still progressing? I think it's kind of all of the above, right? Like um, you start to see that there's a lot of companies like maybe a, like a year ago, they were like talking about ideas and then they started to then say, oh, and I'm going to have the betas. And then, and then nowadays I think we're starting to see that like uh, many companies are releasing like in production their their, their, their systems. Um, and so um, I think in many cases though, they're starting with the like the most obvious base use cases in some cases like um, that then uh, people will then uh, need to adopt and build upon. Um, one of the challenges for enterprises is that like in many, many some of them are very scared of AI for again, for some of these reasons around like AI, um, uh, like you, you don't, you, you have to really know the regulatory landscape, you have to know the security landscape, you have to really think this through. And so even the first use case can sometimes be very hard for them to adopt. And then um, uh, I think over time, like as they do that, then the next wave of features that are more powerful, maybe the next wave of technology, um, some of the new stuff coming out of uh, some of our like partner vendors are just like the way that it's not just about text anymore, it's about multimodal, um, uh, uh, yeah, images, um, we see, you start to see some inter interesting ideas with how people are dealing with videos and audio. Like these things are where I think um, once the enterprises start to digest and adopt some of the things that are coming out available now in production and start to scale that, them up overall, then you'll start to see that it'll be easier for them to adopt the next level of, of um of AI technology that's coming out. Um, and, I, and I think this is why many companies today are looking at like, what's the platform that they can adopt to that would then help them uh, you know, deal with their content or deal with their emails or deal with their editors and, and, and so on. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, definitely, I think it's not even the first inning. I think it's pre-game right now, but uh, it's clearly some low hanging fruit, as you mentioned. I still like this idea. I think there's going to be a system emerging. There's still some cost concerns. I have to ask you, how do you see the continuing, uh, the, on the continuum of AI, you're, do you see it ranging from mostly cost savings uh, or to generating new revenue? Where do you believe where this falls in right now? I mean, I can see both sides of the coin, but is it mostly cost savings initially, or is it moving quickly to generate new revenue? Um, 
it, it, it's uh, I, I think there's sort of a bit of all of it. Like at some point, if um, uh, like if, if your employees and if people who are working um, have things like AI assistance, if they're able to understand their data better, if they're unable to, um, in some cases, like you can like actively engage AI and brainstormers, if you can actively involve them in, in, in product development, like these kinds of things, I think will um, for almost any company across industries, um, it, it helps them. And and you, so you could say, well, it could be cost savings because then if you're more productive, then um, you'll be able to uh, you know save something. But at the same time. Like what we're seeing with a lot of of of, um, of our customers is that they're not saying I want to save. They are saying I want to do more. I want to do. Uh, I want to I want to turn that uh, new value into something that I can externally um, yeah. consider to be a business value. Uh, I, I think like one of the good examples is like GitHub, uh, like Copilot, right? Like the, the idea of using um, AI in your uh, in your engineering. Um, like I have not heard of a single person who's like, oh, now that we are just say. 10%, 20%, 40% more, more productive because of AI, great, we'll get rid of that staff. Instead, they're all like, I, I need, I mean, I, they're limited by um, by the amount of resources they have to hire engineers. So then they're just going to be doing more. They're going to be releasing more. They're going to be making better products. And and, and I think that we're going to see that in a lot of places. Yeah, I think that's a trickle down for sure. I definitely think that's, no one's turning that around. You just kind of was going, my next question I was going to ask you, how do you see the generative AI influencing how organizations and your customers, whether it's your direct customers or your partners in the ecosystem, how does it influence how they build software and, and does it change the type of software it can build in the future? I think it does. Like many of the customers we talk to, um, like uh, there's just sort of this traditional aspect of, of the way that you sell software. One of the first things you want to do is understand like what are some of the problems that 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 customers have, so that you can then focus your on on how you're a solution to it. But but with AI, like one of the first things everybody's digesting is just what is possible. And in fact, I, I had a customer the other day just say like, okay, before we start this call, don't ask me what I'm going to do with AI. I need to understand more about AI so that I can figure out what to do internally. And so then this is a little bit more of the idea of AI becomes a platform by which people then think of new capabilities to be able to deliver in, inside their organization, both for internally, just running their org, creating you know, uh, new, new uh, external facing products uh, and, and so on. It's not a product, it's an enabler. Totally got, that's a great point. Uh, that's, that's worth calling out. I got to ask you on that point, I think data has become, obviously we're hearing that on, on the show, on uh, this episode of uh, data is key. What's interesting is the conversation has been shifting to kind of like what was once passe and old school taboo is now kind of in vogue, right? You got walled gardens, proprietary data sets. I mean, come on, this is like, if you go back 20 years, you couldn't say those words, right? You got like, no one wants a walled garden. Everyone's going to be open. And But now with data being intellectual property, yep. if you look at the large language model, we introduced on the Cube research team, the power law on helping our, our, our audience understand that there's a power law of language models. You got the, the big three or four at the top, they're not going anywhere, but you can interface with them. They're large public models. They use, they call them proprietary, but they're actually public. It's like interesting, right? So like, so you have a mindset shifting going on. You have open source, you got small language models. It could be our transcripts. It could be, so I see, I see an ecosystem more like a neural network API economy around data where distributed data that's walled garden, but open and exposable is going to be a thing. What yeah. do you think about that? I mean, it's uh, kind of out there, but what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I, I was um, talking to one of our customers recently, and we had this discussion: Will will the AI models of the future be more like um, like uh, coffee or like wine? Like, uh, whereas uh, coffee, I mean, of course, there's so many different um, uh, 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 flavors of it, so many different ways. But there's kind of like if you're thinking of coffee, like a lot of people are thinking of big vent, like you know, oh yeah, I had Starbucks this morning, or I had a uh, Pete's coffee, or, or whatever else. Um, and then, and but if you want specialist coffee, they're available. But versus wine, if I say like name me three wines, like probably everybody's going to come up with a different um, set of, of wine. So um, I, my guess is that um, the, you will probably end up more like in the world where there's some very powerful, very dominant models like we've seen so far, like the technology from, from uh, OpenAI, the technology from Anthropic, the technology from um, all the big uh, clouds. Google is, is a great partner of ours. Um, that, like everybody is making not only their own models that are very great, but they're also then have these model gardens that you can select um, amongst these other great technologies. And so um, we believe that that is, is going to be, um, these models will continue to evolve, they continue to get very, very good. Now they are very general purpose and they are very powerful. And so then that leaves open this world of like, sometimes you want to specialist model you want to do you know the equivalent of the 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 certain type of coffee i guess where you 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 know the a certain brand from a certain country that you really like 
And then oftentimes that can lead you to a potentially a cost benefit because the models are smaller. It can lead you to a, a benefit of maybe it's specialized for something you're doing. And we and I think people will will use those. But um, for many cases, um, like especially for our our you know we have all the unstructured content. Like the the more general purpose models are perform very well. And so then um, we we continue to see that um, as they get more capable, which you kind of just even see in the last few months even. Um, and then their price in many cases keeps going down. Like it's just going to get. Um, uh, those those are going to be the one of the first things that people think about when they're thinking about the idea of doing AI on um, uh, for their organization. I mean, it's an interesting point. You mentioned the um, the specialty models. What's interesting, in, and you mentioned unstructured data. One of the problems with unstructured data, as you pointed out earlier, is that it's a sea of unstructured data or a lake of unstructured data. But as you get into these verticals where you have domain-specific um, linguistics or data, whether it's you know multimodal, whatever modal mode it is the vector database trend has kind of pointed to the fact that you can start doing these embeddings within the vertical to get better insights for retrieval, which could also you know, accelerate some of the data transfer, some of the data addressability. What's your thoughts on that? How important is that? Oh yeah, no, it's um, like the, uh, the the vector embeddings, um, I think in, in an interesting way, like um, it, it's it's like the unsung hero in many cases of the new AI revolution. It's like, it's, it's, it's similar like technology in some cases about like, you, you know, there's a big difference between a really good, like powerful, well-trained uh, 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 embedding versus a um, like one that maybe wasn't so good. Um, but then you start to see that like when you have this giant corpus of data, like again, like, you know, like um, an enterprise might have petabytes um, um, of, of data, you know, hundreds of millions of these pieces of unstructured data. And, in order to understand it and get the large language models or these any of these foundation models to process it, you, they have to be able to find roughly the kind of data that you want. And, 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 and it's so much cheaper, more efficient, better, more secure to be able to retrieve it ahead of time and then and then feed a little sort of um, like a, a single question in, um, as opposed to try to train on your whole corpus, which is constantly changing, permissions are changing. And so um, the RAG approach, the retrieval augment, uh, augment generation, the vector, uh, that's that's excellent. The vector databases are, are getting more powerful seemingly every day. There's a lot of great um, uh, vector databases out there. So I, I think this is going to um, be a big part of, of many of the, especially in an unstructured data world, like the way that you handle um, AI overall. It's interesting, We're talking about performance and, and cost, the word memory comes up. You mentioned RAG, which is retrieval, the retrieval aspect of it. There's memory aspect now of these embeddings and there's no, there's new observability metrics emerging that no one has, if I change my model and how do I know whether it's smarter or not, does it restore its memory as in remembering the retrieval versus actually memory on the machine, which lowers your cost for say inferences. We're kind of in a weird time here, don't you think? So you got cost on training and inference and now when you got, I could use maybe open AI for training because I already got built in costs there, but inference now becomes a challenge. Yeah. Um, and data and memory, whether it's memory, you know, for first token out and all kinds of throughput challenges to inference memory. I mean, th this is, how do you rationalize all this? What, how should customers, it's kind of complicated. What do you think? Well, at some point, like um, there, some of the underlying aspects of like um, how the systems work, the 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 compute, the the memory, like um, like they, even their pricing schemes get quite complex. Um, and so, um, I, I think for for most enterprises, um, some of them are going down the path of like building stuff themselves. Um, and then of course, many um, ISVs are building stuff. Like you know, we we build them a lot. But like usually, I think you want to start to associate the cost for some higher level value piece. Trying to understand the the, the underlying aspects, economics of like if I you know rent my own GPUs versus if I, you know, use an off the shelf model. Like um, we're big fans of the idea of the, the, the we have big partners who, who have these wonderful models. So we want to use those um, whenever we can. And, and although in some cases it can be expensive, um, you should be looking at the overall cost per value. So if, if something that was taking a human, um, you know, an hour and you can do that with AI uh, that would have um, make that person more productive and that costs, you know, let's say a few cents or a few dollars in some cases like that. I think you just start to compare those at, at that level. And, and then it's very important to look at the total cost of ownership on these things. You, sometimes people get distracted by the like the token cost or the inference cost of that moment instead of um, and then they, they they try to maybe optimize the wrong things. And so we're big fans of optimizing holistically as opposed to optimizing per uh, one little unit. Yeah, I think that's that comes up a lot when people talk about end to end versus like going in the weeds on one specific thing. What process are you looking at? That's a great point. I got to ask you, what are you guys doing at Box that's a compelling? What's the coolest thing you're working on right now? If you don't mind sharing uh, without giving any public information away. Uh, oh no, we, we just released a bunch of uh, Box works. Um, so the, the thing that we, um, uh, since we have um, so much unstructured data and for our, our enterprises, you know, again, most of the data is is unstructured. And um, we, we believe that we need to be offering um, just infused throughout 
about the um, the whole product, like. Uh, the useful AI capabilities, being able to ask questions of your documents, um, being able to, uh, as you're searching for things, be able to ask things and have the, the system go out, retrieve for you the answers and provide them to you while you're actually finding your data, um, being able to do things like structure your data, help you with security, tagging your, 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 your data. Like these are the things that before, like it would take humans to go do. And now the AI can do it. And it's just very compelling. And then, and then of course, on all of that, like um, we want to make sure that we are also a platform by which people can do um, AI and their content um, overall. And that is something something that is it's important to us and, and to our customers is that at some point you have companies like us who are solving these problems around like um, AI on unstructured data. And we, and, 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 and other people, you're talking, you talk about some of the wrapper companies, like at some point there's a holistic view of how to, to do this. And, and, um, and we, we're solving all these problems. We think we're pretty good at it. And so we, we, we uh, want to offer our services wherever possible to our, all, all of our customers. The big joke or not joke, but the comp the rhetorical question I always ask is, is there an AI operating system coming? Is there, you know, you can almost go, there's, there's going to be like a Linux moment for this industry where, when people go, okay, there's a system that can run across an enterprise and abstract away all those hard problems about siloed data, enterprise search, privileges and permissions and compliance and governance, how do you scale data, integrating without clean rooms. I mean, this is like the nirvana. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, in many ways, the ML ops uh, that kind of came along to help you with the ML set of problems, that was a very powerful set of infrastructure. And then I've seen some companies talk about AI ops, but but really I think that since the AI is so powerful, like you start to say, I need to have like my AI, but in conjunction with like a set of use cases, like on your data um, or um, uh, on, um, uh, the, the way that you're you're pushing your data out through knowledge bases or other things like so this is where I think that you'll start to see like companies that are specialized in platforms for that as opposed to just the underlying infrastructure which is kind of how the ML revolution sort of unfolded. I think there's going to be so much action. I think the whole platform engineering under the hood infrastructure is going to be exciting. You know when the when I saw Databricks announce you know Parquet and Iceberg support that's a, you know a shot across the bow of the industry. It completely democratizes SQL to SQL and unstructured structured data. It's incredible that could be. That could literally put an entrepreneur on the on the playing field tomorrow with a competing yeah. product, a connector. I mean, this is going to open up huge innovation. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Well, Ben, thank you for taking the time to contribute to our SuperCloud Four and coming on remotely into our event. Appreciate uh, your your time and and great contribution with great great highlights, like a little masterclass there. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right, Ben Kuz, the CTO box here, breaking down all the action, the role of generative AI in the enterprise and how companies that have the data, working with data, unstructured data, bringing value and taking away a lot of that un undifferentiated heavy lifting to create the next generation infrastructure and applications. We'll be back with more live coverage here in Palo Alto after this short break. Mm -hmm.